Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Trench Talk. It's a series of webinars geared to the, the nitty gritty of geothermal system design. This is our third uh, episode, and we're going to talk about hydronic system design. If you were at NIGEO, you would have got a shortened version of this. Uh, but today we're going to burrow down a little deeper. Today's agenda. You're going to learn the secret to life. It's not often you can get that in a webinar. Leaving load temperature impact. Choices and consequences. Direct to load. Single speed versus variable speed. Steady state versus cycling. Outdoor reset. And we're going to leave some time at the end for some Q&A. And again, use the chat window to submit any questions. I've got Charlie and Jared standing by to help uh, monitor the chat window. and. Uh, We'll get through the presentation and hopefully we'll have some questions to answer. First of all, the secret to life. You know what the secret of life is? No, what? This. Your finger? One thing. Just one thing. You stick to that and everything else don't mean shit. That's great, but... What's the one thing? Supply water temperature. So now you know the secret to life and temperature will dictate everything in terms of overall performance of a hydronic geothermal system. And this illustrates that very clearly as your leaving load temperature goes up, your COP comes down dramatically. And if you're trying to operate a hydronic system out at this end of the curve, you're better off saving your client some money, put in an air source heat pump that can do COPs of two to 2.2. So if you're trying to make a hydronic system work, with marginal distribution, forcing you to operate at these temperatures, I would reconsider it. The difference between 120 degree leaving load and 93 degree leaving load is nearly 20%. And if you push it all the way up to 140 degrees, you're losing 33% compared to that 93 degree, which would be ideal. We'd like to be in COPs of roughly 3.4 to 4. So that this is the sweet spot of applying geothermal to a hydronic system. And what dictates supply water temperature? This is a pop quiz. Sunspots? The mood of the homeowner might make it hot for you if they're not comfortable. The utility company, nicer to as much as they like to control everything, they don't control supply water temperature. It's up to you. The system designer, you must understand the heat transfer characteristics of each of the heat emitters in the hydronic system. Looking at radiators, I wish I had a nickel for every time somebody asked me, can I use radiators in a geothermal hydronic system? Well, it's not that you can or can't, it's do you want to? Here's the ratings of a cast iron radiator. They only go down to 150 degrees. So we plotted that data and we extrapolate it. It's obviously a linear function. So we'd like to operate down here. 
but the ratings are much hotter water. From a nominal rating of 250 BTUs per square foot at 220 degrees for the average water temperature. So for you to get 220 on average, you're probably going in at 230 coming out at 210 because most systems are designed with a 20 degree delta T. And that is a difference when you look at geothermal. We'd like a 10 degree delta T, just to squeeze a little bit more performance out of the system. But most boiler applications to keep flow rates a little lower, they design around a 20 degree delta T. And this radiator has been rated at all these different average water temperatures. And when you get down to, let's say, 125 degrees, 135 degrees in this range. We're looking at 100 BTUs per square foot. In other words, we're gonna lose at least 60%. And if we want a really efficient system, we're gonna lose about 80%. That radiator simply for a high efficiency hydronic system is simply not a good choice. Let's look at fin tube baseboard. Similar story. They rate it normally down to 150, but this manufacturer did give us data down to 110. But you can see how we can go from seven to 800 BTUs per foot down to 150 to 250. Again, we're gonna have to operate down in this range. So from a nominal rating of 840 down to 300, we're losing 65%. And if you want a higher efficiency, you're gonna lose 75, 80%. The other aspect you have to keep in mind when you go in and size up a house is that these ratings are per foot of actual fin tube area. And quite often baseboard, the, the sheet metal is hiding bare tubing because sometimes they wanna go wall to wall and in, in this decorative cabinet, and may only have three or four feet of fin tube hidden behind it. So when you size up a, a baseboard application, you really got to take the covers off or get a way to get, see in there to see exactly how much fin tube you have. Now, let's talk about one of the better ways to do hydronic with geothermal that's high mass radiant. Typical four inch concrete slab, 65 degree room temperature. It really doesn't matter the tubing size except for pressure drop calculations. Six inch on center, so pretty tightly spaced, a 10 degree differential. So if you've got a well-built house at 12 BTUs per square foot, which is current construction standards, according to the code, with an R1 over the surface, um, the entering water needs to be 93. The way we do that, we look at our heat load and BTUs per square foot, and this is usable square footage. So if you've got cabinets or anything going over the top of this floor, you can't count that square footage. We're talking about the output of the usable floor. So 12 BTUs a square foot will drop us down to about 93 degrees. Great for geothermal performance. And let's talk about another radiant system called staple up. Typical two pipes up and down a joist cavity so nominally eight inch on center, 
We've got heat distribution plates. We've got insulation underneath the tubing. And if we have that same 12 BTUs per square foot, and we go into a similar chart, we're gonna need roughly 120 degree water to drive 12 BTUs per square foot up through that floor. Now, 12 BTUs a square foot is new construction today. You go back 20 to 40 years ago, houses were more like 18 to 23 BTUs a square foot. So let's use 20. If I'm in a slightly older home, 20 BTUs a square foot, suddenly I need 147, 148 degrees. Simply not a good fit for a higher load uh, system. If you can keep your loads low, then staple up indeed can work. Let's look at it from a energy consumption standpoint. What does different design leaving load temperatures mean? If I can keep the, keep the leaving load requirements down to 100 degrees, roughly 9,000 kilowatt hours for a 60,000 design heating load. If I have to push that temperature up to 120, I'm increasing it by 19%. If I push it up to 140, I'm increasing the energy consumption by 34%, very sensitive. However, I'm gonna talk about outdoor reset shortly, but I wanted to illustrate that you can gain back most of it simply by applying outdoor reset. If you're forced to go to these high temperatures, you can drop roughly 28% of that uh, extra energy and get it down closer to what a 100 degree system would do. But even a 100 degree system can benefit from outdoor reset by roughly 12%. Direct the load. Do this not this. I repeat, do this, not this. Any questions? Oh, well, there's a question. Okay, let me explain. This illustrates the direct to load concept. You wanna come out of your heat pump with the hottest water in the system and route it, we're gonna go through the straight leg of this three-way valve. We're gonna go through the straight leg of a T above the buffer tank, and we're gonna feed into the suction side of a variable speed pump that is then feeding all the load devices. I prefer having a variable speed central pump and zone valves, because you will get positive shut off when this pump is running, we don't want any flow in the zones that aren't calling. So the zone valve can provide that positive shutoff. Uh, you can do the same strategy with zone pumps, but you may get phantom flow through some of the circuits, even with a zone pump. If you're gonna put a zone pump in, you could put a check valve in, that would minimize phantom flow, but it may not eliminate it. Another thing I wanna talk about is purge ports. I like to see them on both sides of the central pump. That way you can close the isolation valves on the pump and completely fill the entire system, flushing out any debris that might be in there, flux, garbage, who knows what is in these systems. So this is why we like to illustrate the purge ports on both sides of the central pump. We come back from our load, we wanna go back into the buffer tank. 
However, we want to come out the lowest port to feed back into our heat pump. And when we do this, the buffer tank becomes more of a storage for return water temperature. In other words, if I need 120 degrees to the load, I may set this tank at 108 or 112, somewhere lower so that when I draw the water out, the heat pump's capable of generating an eight to 10 degree rise. And then that feeds directly to the load at 120 degrees. Now this little T turns the buffer tank into a hydraulic separator because whenever the heat pump runs, it's gonna want a certain flow rate. If this were a five ton water to water heat pump, I'd wanna have roughly 15 gallons a minute going into the heat pump. On the load side, you can go a little light, maybe 12 GPM, but you're always gonna want it whenever the heat pump runs. So you may have 12 GPM at this part of your pipe and the load may only need four GPM. So eight GPM is gonna go right back into the buffer tank, building up a hot layer at the top. And you don't get a lot of stratification, but certainly the warmer water will be at the top. Now, if the buffer tank gets satisfied, this heat pump's gonna turn off. The load may still be calling, and when that happens, we're gonna draw from the top of the tank and go right into the central circulator and feed that water. And it's coming back into the buffer tank, cooling it down. And then the temperature control may reactivate the heat pump. We also like to see what we call demand enabled. If there is no zone calling, we might as well disable the heat pump because we really don't know how long it's gonna last. You can get in the middle of a nice sunny day for hours and not have a call. And there's no point in maintaining the buffer tank at some temperature when there is no need for heat. Now we can also talk about buffer tank sizing. I like it as small as possible and it only really serves one purpose, and that is to prevent short cycling of the heat pump. Often people refer to this as storage. Well, it's not very much storage because it uh, can be fully depleted in about 30 minutes. Uh, so I wouldn't want to call it storage. It's simply a buffer tank to provide enough thermal mass so the heat pump does not short cycle. There are some, quote, rules of thumb. I'd say a minimum buffer tank size could be as low as 0.6 gallons per 1,000 BTUs of heating capacity under low load. So you're going to want to look at the heat pump capacity, let's say at about 50 degree entering source water. That way, under low load, that's the kind of condition you might have. So a five ton is probably going to be close to 60,000 BTUs at 50 degree entering water. I would only go down to that 0.6 gallons per thousand BTUs if we have demand enabled. Because if there's at least one zone calling, that too will act like a heat rejector and allow the buffer tank to behave as if it were a little bigger. Normally, one gallon per thousand BTUs is probably a very safe number. There are people out in the industry that'll tell you you need two gallons per thousand BTUs. I respectfully disagree with that because you want it as small as possible to facilitate time to change over from heating to cooling, to minimize your heat losses from the tank so there, and to lower your installed cost. 
So keep that buffer tank at the right size. There's no point in oversizing it. This diagram also illustrates the ability to have a couple of three-way valves that would shift when you get a call for domestic hot water. This happens to be an indirect tank with two internal heat exchangers. We pipe them in parallel to really reduce pressure drop and maintain the type of flow the heat pump wants to see. So it's important to look at the piping the surface area of heat exchanger in this tank is critically important. Stiebel Ultron makes a very good tank. The new net zero stainless steel tanks even have more surface area. So when you get a call, it's first priority to heat domestic. And the th both three-way valves will shift. So we're gonna go up over to the heat exchangers come back through the three-way valve, and the heat pump simply will serve this little runaround loop going and heating the domestic hot water. It makes no sense to send the hottest water in the system, that leaving the heat pump, back to the buffer tank where it will be thermally diluted before going to serve the heating load. A loss of eight to 10 degrees will force the heat pump to operate a higher leaving load to allow the distribution system to deliver the required amount of heat. And we know that supply water temperature is the secret to life. I wanna shift gears. I wanna talk about single speed heat pumps versus variable speed heat pumps. This chart illustrates capacity. The yellow line is the capacity of a single speed heat pump. And it indeed goes up as outdoor temperatures go up, merely because our entering water temperature from our loop is generally warmer. It may be 30 degrees when we're down in this area, but it could be 45 to 50 degrees when we're operating up at this area. So that higher entering source water temperature actually increases the capacity of the heat pump when we need it the least. This curve illustrates the capacity of a variable speed heat pump. And by design, its capacity is gonna modulate to follow the load line. So it's going to run virtually constantly once you get below this transition point. This is a minimum turndown of the heat pump, typically 25 to 30%, uh, depending on which model. But sooner or later, you've reached minimum speed. And when the outdoor temperature gets warmer than that, indeed, you've got more capacity than what you need. So it too will start to cycle. When heating capacity exceeds what's required, the, the equipment has to cycle on and off. Cycling equipment is not as efficient as it is when running continuously, steady state. And unfortunately, all AHRI ratings are steady state. So the question is, what do they do when they cycle? How well do they perform? SCER was developed decades ago, and it was a means to try to capture the degradation and efficiency associated with cycling. It has to do with your part load factor. How much oversized are you? What kind of cycling rate will you have? And the SEER testing was six minutes on, 24 minutes off. And it was developed for air-cooled equipment. And they ran that test when it was 82 degree outside air to really reflect low load 
and to get into this 20% duty cycle. Six minutes out of 30 minutes is a 20% duty cycle. And they came up with a formula. I won't bore you with it now, but basically it was a way to derate the efficiency when it's cycling. It's called the degradation coefficient. And I use that formula against a cycling water source heat pump. And more importantly, this is the steady state COP. As outdoor temperatures got warmer, our entering source water gets warmer, our capacity is way over what we need. And when you apply the degradation coefficient formula to this steady state COP, you get COPs that drop dramatically as much as a full point from 3.6 to 4.7 under these very low load conditions. So the question is, where do we spend most of the time? And this red curve illustrates the number of hours, happens to be for Syracuse, but without a doubt, the bulk, the vast majority of the heating season, that single speed heat pump is gonna cycle and we're gonna lose efficiency just due to cycling. Now let's talk about outdoor reset. If you basically have a choice, you could have a single set point control and control it. This is an absolute worst case of trying to control to 140 degrees, which I would highly uh, recommend that you avoid. But no matter what the outdoor temperature is, if that single set point control is always maintaining 140 versus outdoor reset, and these are adjustable, so you can dial in a curve that meets the specific need of the home. But in this case, we dialed it right down to about 75 degrees when it's 67 outside, and we allow the set point to change as outdoor temperatures get colder, all the way up to that 140 that we need on a design day. Outdoor reset lowers the leaving load temperatures. Outdoor temperatures are warmer. A lower leaving load temperature will result in higher efficiency and perhaps more importantly, less stress on the compressor. I've seen way too many compressors die prematurely because of excessive cycling at high temperatures. It's very stressful. And if you don't believe me, just listen to your compressor when it runs. In terms of kilowatt hour reduction, this can be quite significant. Here's two different curves. The red curve is without outdoor reset and plots the kilowatt hours used at each one of these five degree temperature bins. Simply by incorporating outdoor reset, that curve drops dramatically. We'll save 33% just by incorporating outdoor reset. Plan B, if the hydronics puzzle becomes less than ideal and you're going to end up with COPs of 2.2 to 2.5, I would suggest you consider plan B and geothermal VRF. You can leave the entire hydronic system alone, leave the boiler in place, put in this similar to what everybody's doing with air source heat pumps, multi-head uh, air source VRF. Samsung offers a water-cooled version that can be connected to a geothermal loop and the COPs will be a lot better. 
And with that, I've concluded my remarks and would welcome any questions. I'll let Charlie and Jared sort of guide us on that tour. Well, at the moment, we do not have any uh, questions. Oh, my gosh. Either I put them all to sleep or they knew all this. Charlie has also put up a evaluation poll, and I'd very much appreciate getting your feedback. Um, let me take a look at the chat window. There has been a question asked here, John. Ah, the cooling one for Mike Beaver? Talk about cooling, yes. And it's a good point, because almost always you're gonna go in and, and try to deal with the hydronic system. Quite often, the home doesn't have any air conditioning. So you're gonna have to think about, you know, talk to the customer, do they want air conditioning? And if the answer is yes, then it, I think it's pretty much a no brainer. You find a way to incorporate heat exchange devices that can accommodate chilled water. And there's many of them out there. One of our favorites, let me scoot over to it. The multi-aqua high wall ductless hydronic fan coil. They range from 9,000 to 36,000 BTUs. So if you're gonna put cooling in, you've got a couple of choices. You've got a high wall ductless. You can go with a ducted fan coil. They make some very nice force convector fan coils um, that can handle chilled water. So there's a huge variety out there, but adding the capability to do cooling also allows you to lower the temperature required for heating. You may have baseboard and may need 140 if you have baseboard on a design day, but you throw a couple of these multi-aqua fan coils in that would do cooling, you make them a second stage heat emitter, leave your water temperature down to 120, and allow the fan coil to deliver the heat that the baseboard can't deliver. Um, and there's some interesting thermostats on the market. Uh, let me find one here. The Tecmar 564, I think is an ideal thermostat because it allows for RH1 and RH2 inputs. So in other words, I can have different 24 volt power supplies feeding first stage heat and a different one feeding second stage heat. And that allows us to control a zone valve for radiant on first stage and a different zone valve for a fan coil on second stage. It's also great in a retrofit because you only need two wires going to the thermostat itself Two wires come back to this HVAC interface module that's located in the mechanical room. So, yeah, Mike, indeed, I was talking about having the heat pump be reversible and not only generate hot water, but generate chilled water in the summertime. John, there is a, a question from Rob Campany about, uh, uh, he wants to know about the, the ranges of R value on the flooring, uh, carpet, hardwood. Well, it's a, a full range of potential trouble for sure. The charts, let me go back to that one chart. 
these are the different R values. And for some reason, they're not showing up on the chart. 1.5 to 2 to 2.5 to 3, 3.5 R4. And that's an R4 would be some uh, basically probably a wall to wall carpeting on top of your uh, heat, heated floor. Um, there's some very good design manuals out there that probably better articulate what these are, but you have to assume some R value. People like throw rugs. You're gonna, you're just gonna not have, uh, unless it's a full size ceramic uh, or hardwood or high mass radiant floor, um, you'll probably have some resistance on the floor, typically in the way of throw rugs or area rugs. What else you got there, Jared? Uh, yeah, somebody asked about um, how we were doing on our own installation <laughs> uh, with the net zero. Yeah, it's a typical uh, cobbler's kids have no shoes. Um, we've been squeezing out time to work on it. We're not moving fast enough. Um, I did get word today that the source side piping was leak tested, so that's all good. Um, the load side did yet to be figured out, but we're getting close to filling it up and turning it on. And with the warmer weather coming, uh, I think the staff would greatly appreciate some air conditioning. So within a, within a couple of weeks, hopefully. Um, yeah, I got another question here. Um, this is from Steve Cooper. Thoughts on selectively replacing single fin tube baseboard panels with two or three uh, fin tube panels, uh, such as Smith Environmental, to, to keep lower water temperatures? That's absolutely the things that need to be looked at. And um, the important thing is to understand the output as a function of water temperature. And, and the point of today's session is really do the homework, find devices. There's all sorts of high output radiators. Uh, Runtel is one we've used before. Um, and there's some good high performance baseboard with multiple passes. Um, so read up on their data. And it really boils down to how big is the budget to go through and change out marginal distribution systems? What's that gonna cost? Adding cooling capability versus plan B. Um, so, but the, the point of today's meeting is really emphasize the importance of temperature. Yep. And uh, speaking about fan coils, uh, Tom Meyer asked uh, about um, handling latent loads and dehumidification with chilled water um, systems. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I prefer managing uh, latent or sensible heat ratios with chilled water versus refrigerant. Um, a refrigerant air coil is almost always in that 0.75 to 0.8 sensible heat ratio. And there's not a whole lot you can do with it without significantly uh, compromising the refrigeration design or circuit. So with chilled water, you can dial in a chilled water temperature that uh, can meet your specific needs. So if you need more humidity removal, you may dial your temperature down to 42 degrees. Uh, if you don't have a lot of latent load, you can save some energy by dialing it up to 48, 49. So it gives you a lot more flexibility uh, to, to manage humidity control in different, different load scenarios. But, Almost always 44 to 45 degree chilled water will give you that roughly same 
refrigerant-based sensible heat ratio. Um, but I find it's a whole lot easier to adjust chilled water temperatures than try to adjust refrigerant temperatures. Excellent. Um, someone had asked about uh, if we would be putting our recording up on the website. And uh, well, uh, Charlie had put the, uh, the link to our Trench Talk library. So I said you're going to show that now. Yeah. Get people familiar with our website. You go to our website, you go to the mechanical room and Trench Talk Library. And here's our first two recordings here. And we'll just keep stacking them on top as we accumulate more. I also convert the PowerPoint into PDF slides that you can download. And there's also a suggestion box for other trench talks if uh, you're interested. Absolutely, good point, Jared. And by all means, I really want feedback as to what would you like us to talk about? Um, there's all sorts of subjects that are bouncing around in my head, but uh, any feedback uh, is welcome. Excellent. Um, and there's one last comment from, um, from Jeff here asking, or just saying that uh, for new construction that he prefers to use a warm board um, as a subfloor material uh, to do radiant. Yeah, I've heard a lot of good things about warm board. I, you definitely want to get in early and talk to the builder and make sure they understand the value of it acting as a subfloor. Um, I know the warm board folks do an excellent job at creating a bill of materials and doing the layout work. Um, so I, everything I've heard, it's an excellent product. I think there's others, uh, Ray Howe and Upanor. I think any above floor system that, that they're all fairly close in terms of performance, but warm board does have that extra feature of allowing you to deduct the cost of conventional subfloor. Uh, staying on radiant, uh, Rob asks, do you recommend slab temperature sensors uh, in an in-floor radiant system? I think it, it does help the control of, to avoid overshoot, uh, which can happen very easily on some high mass radiants. I've got some scar tissue on a job that um, uh, it's a six inch slab and unfortunately, the installer put the PEX at the bottom of the slab. So it's cranking heat into that slab without a slab sensor. And about 10 o'clock in the morning, the sun's up, it's shining into this room, adding the solar gain plus the inertia of the floor because it's been heating all night long. And a slab sensor would have uh, sort of curtailed it um, before it got into a runaway situation. So yes, I think slab sensors are a much better way to control the, the space temperature. I think that's it uh, for questions at the moment. Okay, then I'll let you um, want to say thanks to all of you for taking the time and listening to me uh, ramble a little bit. Um, again, I want to encourage you to give us suggestions, give us feedback. Um, and uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you all here next month. We're not sure what the topic is yet, but uh, we're going to explore some different things. So we're going to call it a night, and I think it's Miller time. So thanks, everybody. Talk to you later.